Hello everyone, I want to give you a quick revision, brush up, catch up lecture on Haskell because your exam is coming very soon. Thanks for your patience, sorry it's taken me a while to get around to doing this revision lecture but I hope it's close enough to the exam so you've looked at the material now and you've perhaps had another go at the Future Learn MOOC and hopefully you've even looked at some past exam papers. Just a word of reassurance, although this year's exam conditions are different, the structure and style of the exam is very similar to previous years. So um, looking at those is certainly a good thing to do. Now I want to bring up my whiteboard here and go through some Haskell source code. Great, so here we are. Uh, sorry, my whiteboard drawing skills are rather poor. Lambda x goes to x. Uh, there we go, it's the identity function here. And we know the type of the identity function as well, don't we? Uh, has type, that's double colon, A goes to A. Notice the common structure between the arrow in the function, the term, and the arrow in the type. So this says it's a function type, this says it's a function term. Right, so the identity function just spits out whatever you give it. It returns its input, effectively. And the A here is a polymorphic type. A could stand for any or arbitrary. Okay, let's look at another function now. If I rub this out. Ooh, hey, that's good, isn't it? And this out. Right, and draw again. Lambda x y goes to y x now what's the type of this function lambda x y goes to y x we've got two inputs and this is a single output here well look x is the argument that's being applied to y. So we know that y must therefore take in an x and give out something. So if we wanted to look at the um, uh, type of y, oh, come on, right, we want to think about its type, well, it's going to take in an x, so let's say the x has got type A, and then it's going to return something, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the same type, so let's say that's going to be a B. Okay, so Y itself has type A to B. A and B are both polymorphic type variables. Okay, so now we know, we've kind of decided that X has a type A. Okay, so lambda X, Y here, we know that this here has type A. We know that this here, the Y, has type A to B. And so what's the return type going to be? Well, it's going to be, let's think about this. It's going to be a B because we've applied something of type A to something of type A to B. The overall type, this whole thing, is going to be a B. Which means this function, this lambda term here, has type A, goes to A to B, goes to B. Great. So, um, I'm going to go to our old friend, Oops Daisy, Hugo. Hugo. So in here, I'm going to look for... Um, something that has type A goes to A to B goes to type B. Oh, Google's not very useful. Oh, here we go. Look, here, here we go. A goes to A to B goes to B. Okay. And this is the type here. 
Ampersand. Ampersand is a reverse application operator. This provides notational convenience. Presence is one higher than that before the application operator dollar, which allows and to be nested inside dollar. So um, what this is saying is effectively we um, kind of put the function on the right hand side and its argument on the left hand side and then it kind of turns them round. Um, so can I demonstrate that? Um, let's see. Hello. Once time. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'm actually stealing somebody else's slides here. These slides were drawn by Simon Payne Jones. Um, he explained these at a, a seminar in Glasgow a good few years ago, but I think, like any good professor, he recycles his slides and uses them frequently. I'm just going to borrow a couple of slides here. Look, it says Haskell in one slide, though actually it's two, but uh, never mind, we'll let him off Haskell in one slide. So look at this function here. It's the filter function, which should be familiar to you. That's a higher order function on lists. So we can see the type here of the filter function. It has type, the double column means has type. And it's got two arguments, alpha to bool, which is a predicate, goes to alpha list, goes to alpha list. There's the result type there, the alpha list, okay? And these two values here are going to be the arguments. So the first argument it takes is a predicate, okay, which is a um, function that returns a bool given an argument to type alpha, and we've got a list of alphas. So what this filter function is going to do is going to apply the predicate to every member, every item in this list, and returns back a list only containing items that satisfy or meet the predicate. Okay, so that's the idea, that's the intuition. And we see it's a higher order function, you see here, a higher order function, which means, well, in the lectures I remember we find a higher order function is one that eats other functions for breakfast. Um, don't write that in the exam if you're asked about higher order functions. Instead you should say something like, a higher order function is one which takes other functions as parameters or returns other functions as results. Okay, great. So a higher order function operates on other functions. Okay, functions are values, remember, in a functional language. Right, okay, so here we've got a filter function, okay, and uh, we've got our type signature, as type, we've got a higher order type here, and uh, that's the other thing to talk about polymorphism. So here, the list of A's, A is arbitrary, it can be a value of any type at all, or indeed a uh, a list of values of any type here. Okay, so A is a type variable. It's not bound to a concrete type at the moment, but will be uh, when filter is applied. So let's look at the definition of filter, and I'm going to scroll down to the next slide now. Look, so functions are defined by pattern matching. And we see here we've got two patterns, filter with a predicate on the empty list, and filter with a predicate on the non-empty list. That's the pattern there, a list with a head X and a, a tail XS, X cons XS. XS could be the empty list, of course, but uh, this is a list with at least one element, whereas this is a list with exactly no elements. This is the base case of the recursive function here. Okay, so if we're filtering a predicate over an empty list, well, then it's only going to return the empty list. Trivially, nothing satisfies the predicate. If uh, we're filtering, filtering with the predicate on a non-empty list, well, then we check uh, to see whether X satisfies the predicate, and then if it does, then we cons x onto the filtering of the tail. Otherwise, this is the, um, the kind of catch-all condition here, the default case, if you like. Uh, we filter on the rest of the list and we discard x. x is not going to be in the result because it doesn't satisfy the predicate. So we see functions defined by pattern matching. We've got two guards here. The vertical bar indicates the, the guards, OK? And uh, here, that's just a syntactic thing. We don't need brackets round function parameters. Great. So um, according to Simon Payton Jones, this is Haskell in one slide here, type signatures, higher order functions, which allows us to have function values, polymorphism, working for arbitrary types. And uh, well, here we go, we can declare data types as well. And uh, these ones here, of course, are declared in the, the prelude, the standard library of Haskell, bool is true or false. Okay. And um, alpha list is either an empty list or um, an alpha value cons down to a list of alpha values. Great. Okay, so apparently that's Haskell in one slide. That's all you need to know. So says Simon Peyton Jones.
So I wanted to try and explain for the last time for you um, about monads. Now, you might have seen lots of different monad tutorials and explanations. Some of them are good, some of them are awful, some of them are incredibly complicated. I want to try and present a simple analogy here, and it might help, it might not. So, suppose you've got a bag of money. You're rich. Okay, it's your bag of money. And then, suppose you go to the shop. In the shop, you hand over money to get a bag of food. Okay? So, uh, the shop function is effectively money to bag of food. Right? So, you start with a bag of money, and you want to give money at the shop and come out with a bag of food. And that's the, the, the monad bind, you see. Bag of money, and money goes to bag of food. Okay, and that's going to give you back the back of food. So this is the, the monad bind idea here. Um, this has been presented in alternative ways, monad as burritos. You could perhaps look at that link as well. I think the clearest graphical explanation is in the link below, and uh, it's something I've recommended to you before. It is important to understand about monads, and as you know, they've appeared in every exam paper I've set for the past three years, and <laughs> there's a likelihood they might appear again this time as well. Okay, can I show you this in Haskell? Here we go, that's bag.hs. And what I want to do is have a type, which is a bag, which has got something of an arbitrary type inside it. And we're going to derive the show type class so we can print out the bag on the terminal. Great. Okay, so I want this bag class now to be an instance of the monad type class, which means it also needs to be an instance of the functor type class, instance functor bag, where I remember functor, we need to define the fmap function, fmap bag, fmap f, bag x equals bag fx. So you see, we just take the function inside the bag and apply it. That's fmap. Okay, instance functor. Let's make this an instance replicative as well. Replicative bag where, and now we need to use the apply function, which is this one here. Okay, so we've got a bag with a function inside it and a bag with an argument inside it. The result is just going to be a bag with the function applied to the argument. Great, that's applicative, and now we can define the monad, instance monad bag, where return, ah yes, so we do need to go back and define one more thing for the applicative, we need to define pure, which just takes a value x and puts it inside a bag, bag x there, and that's the same as return for the monad, just puts an arbitrary value inside the bag. And then we'll also define the bind function, okay? So if we've got a value x, okay, uh, which is inside a bag, and then we've got a function f, which is going to go from um, a value unwrapped to a value inside a bag, possibly of different types, that's a to mb, right? Then we're going to say that this is going to give us a bag, with f applied to x, oh, but the f already puts the thing inside the bag, so it's just gonna use f applied to x, in fact. So we take x out of the bag, and then feed it as the input to f. Okay, so that's all the code we need, in fact. Doesn't look like much, does it? But now we can start using bags inside GHCI. So I'm going to load bags.hs. Great, info bag. There we go. So now I can say here is a bag with 10 pence inside it. Let's call this wallet. Okay, right. And now I'm going to have a shop function. Okay, which takes some money, x amount of it, and is going to, um, let's get this right now, um, give us that many, what should we sell in our shop? Let's sell turnips. There we go, it gives us that many turnips, um, which is a string, and we want to return it inside a bag. 
Okay, that's the shop function. Let's look at the type of shop. Okay, so given that A can be shown, then we take an A and return a bag of a string, a character list. Okay, so now what we can do is we can shop with five coins and get back a bag with five turnips. Okay, or we can shop with 10 coins and get back a bag with 10 turnips. Or look at our wallet. Well, it's got 10 things in it. We can't shop with our wallet. Oh dear, well, <laughs> we can. We get like a bag with a bag with 10 turnips in it. That's no good, is it? Mm. Uh, what I really wanted to do was say wallet bind shop, which should give us back a bag with 10 turnips in. Yeah, so my problem is, let's go back to the shop definition. I want to constrain lambda x so that x is only an int. Okay, so I want this whole thing to have type int goes to a bag a string. Okay, so now I've constrained it. If I go back here and try shop wallet, it says, ah, I can't match an int with a bag of int. But if I go wallet bind shop, then I should still get my bag with 10 turnips. Hmm, great. Okay, this is only one way of explaining monads, and it may or may not be an intuitive way, but uh, thanks for humoring me anyway. Okay, just a couple more things to say. Uh, remember, the not equals operator in Haskell is slash equals rather than pling equals. Also, uh, when you want to uh, not a Boolean value, you need to type it NOT not rather than exclamation mark like you would in C. Negative numbers, put them in brackets, okay? Because minus without brackets is the, 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 the two operand function. Okay, a uh, couple more things to say just from a, a general point of view. If you have a value inside IO, so for instance an IO int, you can't unwrap the IO int to get an int. Well, you can with unsafe perform IO, but otherwise you can't unwrap the IO int. Once you're in IO, you've got to stay in IO, which is okay because the main function itself is an IO unit type. Great.